No, I know, but I'm saying then I, I'm, I'm literally just like, what is my process? Is and you should process wash. Okay, that's so you are now streaming live and I've made you host. Also, you can make me co-host as I'll be teaching this class. Very good. You are now co-host. Good to have you here, Harry. Thank you. And any uh, requests, like how do you want the questions? Like, do you want me to speak up in, in between or do you just want, <coughs> want the... I'm going to ask people to put some um, information in the chat to start with, some, some questions they have or any concerns about travel, and I'll address those. And then um, I think while I'm talking, I'm going to do some demonstrating, show some websites where they can get travel information. And then um, I'll ask them to put, otherwise put their questions or comments or observations in the chat. And then at the end, We'll have plenty of time for group discussion, 15 minutes probably, where I'll ask them to put their hand up with a virtual hand raise. Depends on how many okay. people we have. Okay. Um, if there's only 15, we don't need to do that. But if I can't see them all on the screen, I'll ask them to do that. Yeah. There, were, there were a lot of people signed up for this class earlier. Okay. Check here. There were 29. So we'll see how many come. Okay. Uh, here, I just want to tell you that uh, you have voices coming in the background, so I don't know if that's fine for the class. Okay, thanks. I'll notify them.
Hi, Elaine. Hi, Mary. Hi, Joanne. We've got some avid travelers here tonight, I know. Elaine's got herself safely on the South Seas, I think. Maui. <laughs> nice. Hi, Dania. Hi, Jane. Hi, Russ. Well, we've got a good group here tonight. We can get lots of collective wisdom. I have my pen down. <laughs> Hi, Pat. Welcome. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Leslie. Good evening, everyone. And Elaine, you just had someone appear briefly and then disappears, kind of like uh, an apparition sort of swooped into the island and then vanished. You know, that is one of the odd things about using virtual backgrounds. Welcome, Pat, to you as well. And Yuta is coming. Welcome, Yuta. As we get going tonight, I'll say this more than once. Um, I'd really be interested to know what types of safety issues you'd like to know about in a class, because I've got them kind of grouped under three areas. Hopefully, I haven't uh, missed any. The first one is kind of like health safety. So like we're all concerned right now about pandemic and COVID-19 and keeping ourselves safe from that. That's the first concern. And then uh, second concern about traveling safely is um, uh, pr protect yourself from physical harm. That means you don't want to get mugged. I suppose it could also mean you don't want to fall and slip somewhere and get hurt. That could also... Uh, but that happens everywhere all the time. So we're always trying to be careful of that. And the third area of safety is in, under the area of keeping your valuables safe when you, when you travel, I know. And that can be domestically and internationally. Actually, all of these relate both uh, domestically as well as internationally. But we do know that if we're Americans traveling, traveling abroad, there are... Uh, things we need to learn about where we're going. There's things about customs and uh, I don't mean like the customs duty. I mean like customs, local customs and 
safety and areas. So we'll be talking about that. But if you all have any particular areas of safety you'd like to hear us discuss tonight, please put your idea in the chat and I'll make sure I come around to that uh, because I'm going to be talking broadly about health, um, pandemic health. I'm going to be talking about keeping yourself physically safe and then also about protecting valuables. And if there's, if you want to hear about any of those, please just put that in the chat. So I know what your interests are tonight. And uh, also if there's other interests I've missed of keeping safe, this was a highly requested class for get set up travel section. So glad to do it. I'm also aware, and I'll just give you a caveat right off the bat. I'm aware that uh, safety is perceived differently by men and women. So I'm a man. So I enjoy the input of women uh, about traveling safely. So you can also put your thoughts in the chat about that. As I'm presenting tonight, I will pause for some questions, but also you can put your questions in the chat. We'll look for them there. Glad to have you all with us. We're gonna give it about one more minute before I start uh, to allow people to gather in. And then uh, I'll share my screen with you. Um, and I think I know most of the folks here, but if there's anybody that's new, to travel classes or to get set up, go ahead and raise your hand or raise a virtual hand. Um, Cause I really wanna welcome you, welcome you to our travel series. There's all, of course many things you can learn to get set up. So travel is just one area and we really are glad for the learners that come into all of the areas of learning and get set up. I'll just check here, uh, and we and by the way, we have Harry, who is our TA, who can help anybody with questions. He'll also be keeping an eye on questions in the chat. So again, before I start sharing, if you have particular safety issues you'd like to see us ad me address tonight, or questions about that, please put them in the chat now, or while I'm talking. If you have questions during the presentation, you can put them in the chat. Uh, I'll also be pausing for questions. So we'll have many opportunities and we'll have some nice discussion at the end. So I'm looking forward to all of you participating as you're well, as you are comfortable participating. I'm gonna go ahead and do a screen share and you should see something in a second that says, uh, traveling safely, Do we are we at traveling safely good? Uh, yes. Great. We're on the same virtual page as I usually say. I'm your guide, Russ Eanes. I'm from Harrisonburg, Virginia, a pretty safe town. I'm a writer, a walker, and a cyclist. I formerly was a book publisher, and as a publisher, my favorite thing was to help authors shape their ideas into a book. And I'm now a full-time guide with Get Set Up, and I love the energy I get from working with older adults. In case you're new, Get Set Up helps you learn useful things from people like you. So you useful skills from people like you so you can do wonderful things. We learn from each other. Ideally, we can see you and your cameras are on. You can request a recording of this class after it's done. You can email help at getsetup.io and they'll send you a link. If anyone's joining by live stream and we have got, we are live streaming tonight. So there may be some folks watching it in live stream. The best way to participate is to join us and register for class. And you can give a question to me in live time. Uh, by the way, lastly, Get Set Up is not paid to promote any specific products. We are strictly an educational organization. So lastly, I'll just mention if anybody has issues that you would like to discuss about uh, safety and travel, please put them in the chat now or while I'm talking, put more questions in or comments or observations, things you know about traveling safety so we can gather some wisdom from all of you tonight. Safe travel can mean these three things to me, staying healthy, protecting yourself from physical harm, and protecting your valuables, at least as we've had discussions with people in classes lately about traveling safely. These are usually the issues that you bring up. So uh, kind of a ground rule though, before I go into some of these uh, in specific, is just to say that wherever you're traveling, always know the risks of where you're going. 
Um, you want to read re guidebooks, travel forums. When you're on location, ask locals advice, not just about what pub to go to or where to get a good meal, but is it safe in such and such a uh, part of town? Is the subway safe after 9 p.m. at night? Um, is this part of the city safe? Those are all things that locals can tell you. Um, there are some online links. I'm going to actually show you one right now uh, where you can use forums to find out information about your travel ahead of time. This is one I really like. I walked the Camino de Santiago in 2018, 500 miles. And before I went, I started gathering information about it on a forum called the Camino Forum. This is it right here at home. It's the Camino de Santiago Forum. And under the forum, there are lots and lots of discussion topics. And if you scroll down here, you'll find this is really interesting. We're not going to see it. Oh, my part. Oh, everybody. I'm so sorry. Thank you for flagging that right away. Let me go out. And I didn't share that with you. My bad. There we go. Now we're back to it. Now you should be able to see the Camino form. Is that right? Yeah. Sorry, everybody. Um, I'll go back and show you again. This is the form right here. It looks like this. And I found lots of travel information. Well, lots of information about walking the Camino here. Almost too much information. But uh, if you go into the forum discussion topics, and there are many, this, these are all threads. What I found interesting is if you look down here, some of the things we're talking about tonight are some of the issues that uh, are most common. COVID in the Camino, look at this, safety and security in the Camino. Uh, so if you had a, any issues or questions about Camino, it's probably one of the most common asked by women who walk it, especially if they're going solo, it is, is it safe? You can come to a forum like this, click on that, and you'll find under that whole section, all these discussion threads, okay? Pers there's one whole section called personal safety for women on the Camino, tips from the moderators, pilgrim safety. So uh, I recommend that if you're going somewhere new, if there's a travel forum and TripAdvisor is a travel forum that can give you this type of information about where you're going, it's a great way to do some investigation before you get there. So let's say you're going to Florence and you want to know, are there areas of Florence that aren't safe after dark? Probably TripAdvisor can say something like that. You can go in and search under those terms. Uh, Russ, are you suggesting that we Google like Florence Forum, or are you saying go to TripAdvisor and they'll link you to these other forums? Go to TripAdvisor, and then you could put in the terms like, uh, for example, safety, safety plus Florence, safety for women plus Florence, or something like that. I'm giving some examples of forums. Another place to get lots of information that really can be good if you know what you're doing is on Facebook groups. There are scads. I don't know how many thousands of Facebook travel groups there are. I'm part of about 20 or 25. Uh, for example, some of you may have seen last night, I did a presentation on riding from Pittsburgh to Washington, DC on a rails to trails. There's a great Facebook group on that. And a lot of these Facebook groups gather certain topics that come up again and again, and they put them under a section that you can search for and find. So, um, I, would, I haven't had time to research it yet, but I will. I'm guessing there are lots, and there are lots of, uh, for example, Facebook groups dedicated to walking the Camino de Santiago. Oh gosh, there's at least 20. I'm probably a member of 10 or 15. And in those groups, there are whole sections of frequently asked questions. And I've noted that safety is always one of the topics of a frequently asked question. So it's a good way to go and search on a topic um, if you're traveling somewhere, TripAdvisor has that um, because it covers the world in that broad sense. But then if you know specifically, if you're doing a certain type of travel, uh, Rick Steves has whole sections and articles about traveling safely. So there's lots of good information out there. Educate yourself on it before you go. So that was kind of my main thing is spend time doing a little research. Even it's just a couple hours before you go somewhere and the guidebooks are good. They'll tell you that information as well. 
So that's know the risks of where you're going. Um, now, looking at staying healthy as we come out of the pandemic, pandemic, I found uh, three sites, and you'll get these links in your notes so you can find them yourself. I'll show them to you, but also I'll send you the links and you can look at them yourself later, where you can find information about traveling in a pandemic. Uh, the first one is the most unusual one of all, travel requirements from the Raleigh-Durham Airport. Why the Raleigh-Durham Airport has become the best place in the US to get this information. I'm not sure, but they're really good. I'll show you that in a minute. You can also go to the CDC, Center for Disease Control. And I found another site called Travel Bands, which is a uh, some people who go out and try to scour and find all the information per country for you. So these are all ways um, that you can find information about safety you know, in the time of the pandemic. Uh, the destination countries, you sometimes have to dig a little bit, have information on their own countries. And I also say it isn't enough to say, you know what, I can go to Iceland from America. I think I'll go to Iceland and think you've taken care of all the concerns. There can be restrictions coming home. Actually, this was one of the big concerns for people uh, last year. I was actually thinking of going somewhere in March, just when the pandemic was starting, thinking, you know, maybe it won't be so bad. And the one thing that kept me from going was, you know what? I might fly out of the U.S. and two weeks later discover that it's going to be really difficult or impossible to get home. In fact, I knew people who were stuck overseas. So there can be restrictions coming home. You may be required to have a, right now, I, I think you're required to have a negative test three days before you come home. I'm pretty sure that's the case. But this information changes all the time. So I'm going to show you some of this information. I'm going to go to this Raleigh-Durham Airport travel requirements. Uh, and that's not it. Go back and... Um, Okay, you see Raleigh Durham International Airport? <laughs> Says it'd be a Raleigh, Raleigh, Raleigh Durham International Airport travel requirements. So they've they've they're just really up to date on this. And you can look in the at, at, at what uh, the restrictions might be in the US. So for example, in the US, most states are this kind of dark blue, which means they're open to visitors. Uh, some of them are medium blue, which means they're open with some restrictions. I'm not going to go into that into detail, uh, but it's important information to know. For example, I went to Maine last summer to see my son and daughter-in-law and grandson, and we were required to uh, quarantine for two weeks before we got there, and we were required to stay quarantined for a week after we got there. We only stayed for a week, so we were basically quarantined the whole time we were there. But if you want to check a world map, okay, now... You can see what the story is all over the world. And um, in a few cases, they don't have information, like the destination is not available at all. But you can see many places that are gray have restricted entry. Uh, some of them in light blue, like the US, are open with restrictions. And then some are strictly open to visitors. So example, right now, if you go to Mexico, it's totally open. In fact, my daughter's going down there tomorrow with her husband. Ah. Uh, Costa Rica, there are a lot of countries in the world that are open like this. And if you were to zoom in, you'd find out, let's try to zoom in a bit here. Uh, everybody see we're looking over Europe right now. Uh, you can go to Albania and Bulgaria and Serbia. No, so uh, Serbia and North Macedonia and, Alba and our Albania are all of, have no restrictions right now. Uh, and I have actually read the Bulgaria uh, is is a place that's open. So this is a useful map and you can click on it. Bulgaria, open with, with, with restrictions. It says most passengers from the United States of America are not allowed to enter Bulgaria. Well, that just contradicted what I told you. Um, quarantine may be required, uh, COVID tests, vaccination. So, so much for Bulgaria. Um, I have read otherwise that it's open. Um, Weekly, there is a, uh, a forum in the New York Times and the Washington Post, which are two of our big national newspapers that have links of information where you can travel. And those are often free. You don't have to have a subscription to the paper to get COVID-19 information. I'll, put, I'll send you that link as well. That's more up to date perhaps than this. 
but this is a place that you can now see where you can go, what, what's open, what there's, I just clicked on Spain. Uh, most passengers from the United States are not allowed to enter Spain, quarantine, pretty much the same information. Uh, and then you can click down here for more information. Now, a couple other of these, this is, I'm gonna show you the CDC. So this is the whole thing from the Center for Disease Control. Um, what I found a little concerning when I looked at this today and I was looking over it was it said it was last updated April 2nd. So either that means they're not updating their website or they haven't changed any of their restrictions or any of their requirements since April 2. I'm assuming that's what it means that they haven't changed anything. Uh, but you can go down here and there's all sorts of useful information when not to travel, safe travel ideas. You could click on that and it would tell you how to keep safe while you're traveling. So the CDC is up on this, um, but uh, you can click on cruise ship travel. Okay. I don't want to give feedback. No, thank you. Uh, this was updated May 5th. So this is up to date. It says uh, travelers returning from cruise ship and river cruise voyages. Um, right now, the CDC is recommending that you avoid travel on cruise ships, including uh, river cruises worldwide. So this is what the CDC tells you, Center for Disease Control. Then there was this one I came across called travel bans today. And this is a, uh, a, a, a I think it's a husband and wife team that are scouring the world for information. So let's, let's, let's drill down into uh, Europe again and let's see if they have different information on Bulgaria. Bulgaria travel restrictions, uh, open for citizens, partial, open for foreigners, partial, open for tourism, partial, quarantine, partial. So here are, you can click into a country and you can get more information uh, under any of these things here, airline updates, this was, this was really old. <laughs> so full <laughs> restrictions. Um, I'm looking for information. Th this right here is from yesterday. This is uh, more information about Bulgaria. So you can go in here and this is, this, is, this is from May 4th. Remember the Europeans do their dates backwards or as they would say, we do ours backwards. So four or five means the 4th of May. 2021. So um, you can drill into the information here and find out the latest that they've scoured and found. So I, I like these sites. Um, there is also, if you go to the United States government, this is under the Department of State, uh, travels.state.gov. You can find more information here about travel. And we don't know anything yet about the so-called uh, vaccine passports that they're discussing. Uh, that's probably been in the news. We've probably all heard about that over the last couple of months. Um, but here, so here, here you go, the top, this is pretty old, January 28th, COVID-19 testing required for US NT. Um, beware though, even though I said that's old, that could mean that they haven't changed anything since January 28th. And that's probably more the case that they're requiring testing required for U.S. entry. In fact, let's click on that and see if we get information. Effective January 26, they're requiring all passengers two years age and over in the United States da, 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 must have a test within three calendar days of departure. That means returning home. That's what I've been hearing. So even though it says January 28, that's probably current information. Let me pause here and see if anybody has a question about this area of COVID-19 safety flying. Maybe you have some better information than I've got, or you just want me to show you one of these sites again. Could, and by the way, also that forum that I showed you where you can go to. How You're can sending I link Paul. Let's see. Melinda, you were asking a question? I just wanted to double make sure that all these links are going to be included in your notes. All of these links will be included in the notes, yep. There was another question. Russ, how yes. could you be partial? What does partial mean? You could partially come in. What, how could you partially come in? Yeah, well, we didn't drill deep enough to find out what that means. Um, <laughs> I think it was a partial restriction. Yeah, so well, let's go back and see if we can find this here. We were, it was here, wasn't it, when we were looking at this one? Uh, here's full restrictions. 
Um, let's pick a country. Let's go to Costa Rica, everybody. It has to do with if you're a citizen or not. Thank you. Um, well, I guess Costa Rica is considered part of North America. All right. Costa Rica, I know, is open to travel. Open for U.S. citizens, yes. Open for foreigners, yes. Open for tourism, partial. And uh, full restrictions. Um, it says this was from, looks like it was from the 27th of April. It says, uh, well, oh, I see. This is an older uh, thing from the 5th of April. Um, this is telling you what their what their restrictions are. And thank you, Yuta, for clarifying what partial restrictions mean. Pat, did you have a question? I just wanted to comment. I'm in Mexico now. And before I left, um, I was in communication with the resort where I was going to stay. And they, as well as what I had found out on my own, um, they require a negative COVID test before you can get back into the United States. Yes, and that's what we were seeing that the US government is still requiring. Um, I've been vaccinated and fully vaccinated for a long time. I'm assuming most of you are in that situation. And we all know that even though we get vaccinated, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that we can't transmit COVID to someone else. So that's uh, staying healthy part of this. And it's a big part of it right now. Uh, let me go into the section about protecting yourself from physical harm. And this is where uh, women can see it differently than men. And I don't mean that they see it differently. Like men just don't see it. They, they experience it and can feel different and it can feel less safe than a man. And that's just simply a fact. Um, I would say that when you're traveling somewhere, the first thing to do is to talk to the locals. If you're staying in a guest house or an apartment and you've got a host, ask them. If you're staying in a hotel, ask the front desk. Or if you meet other locals in restaurants or anywhere that you manage to talk to somebody, you can find out if a certain area is safe. Um, it all comes back to knowing the risks of where you're going. And uh, it's true, there's all, there is safety in crowds, but that's also where pickpockets go. My wife and I were discussing tonight whether it's best to look exactly like a tourist who's real safe and got all your stuff and have them know you're a tourist or try to look like a local. And I've decided that it's really hard for me to look like a local. I tend to just look like who I am. And I'd rather uh, I carry something safely. My wife carries a cross the body bag uh, about the size of a small purse that she can either slide around to her back or she can slide it around the front. They also make these for men. I actually don't uh, take one, but I could if I wanted to. Uh, and I do recommend them because you can slide them around to your front, like when you're on a bus or a subway. So your valuables or whatever you've got is right there in front of you. You can't have anybody slip into your, into the bag. Of course, I always recommend that you, um, well, we'll get to see, we'll get to protecting your valuables is the next thing. Let me come back to this question about protecting yourself from physical harm. Anybody here have any advice or experience that you'd like to, to talk about uh, in that in that sense? Hi, Russ. Um, when I was in Mexico City, I boarded a bus, a uh, regular city bus, and all of a sudden there was this crunch of people around me and I could feel fingers crawling on my arm and Ooh. I just yelled. And all of a sudden, everyone just dispersed. Yeah. Well, thankfully I had a heavy duty leather purse because somebody had taken a knife and slid up the side of it. So I would recommend uh, getting some kind of heavy duty material for your purse or your bag or whatever. Yes, and you know, often these uh, crossbody bags are made with ripstop nylon, which is harder for someone to right. cut open. That's what my wife's is made of. Thanks for that advice. Thanks for that sharing that story. I do know people that have that have been have had their pockets picked in uh, other countries. Um, my recommendation. Well, let's let, let's uh, let, let's go to talking about protecting your valuables since we've sort of gotten into it. 
Um, my first bit of advice is number one, leave most of your valuables at home or just take the minimum with you. Um, you really don't need much uh, other than identification and money while you're traveling and you can protect those easily. I tend to uh, use zippered pockets and I even have zippered pockets that are inside pockets. So they're really hard to get into. And I carry, I actually have something, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you here at the end uh, um, that I carry cash in that uh, fits so sleek, it so, uh, fits in my pocket of my pants so well that it really gets down in there nestled. And I even have a pair of pants that have a zipper pocket on the right-hand side. It would be, even I have a hard time getting my wallet out of letting alone someone else getting into there. Um, but number one, I'd say leave most of your valuables at home. Secondly, just be aware of your surroundings. Like uh, you were saying a minute ago, you know, you suddenly realize you're, there are a bunch of people uh, crowding around you and you found an, a, a hand, some fingers crawling up your arm. That's an awareness of your surroundings. And that's what I tell people. I mean, the, the closest I've had have had anything happening to me, besides being accosted by someone who was so drunk, I don't think they could even knew, knew that there was just one of me. They probably thought there were two of me standing there on a street corner was when I was in Cologne a few years ago, I took a very early train in and was crossing the square. There weren't very many people around and a couple of young guys came up and started yelling at me. And, um, Anyway, I just pretended like I didn't understand them and they went away. After saying a few things, cursing to me in English, they all figured out that I was uh, someone who spoke English because my German was so bad. Um, so anyway, be aware of your surroundings, uh, you know, early in the morning, late at night. Um, perhaps if you're in a country in a rural area that where the rural area might not be safe or some, some countries, the city might be not as safe. Just be aware of that uh, where and where and when you are safe to be there. Um, I used to talk about using over the shoulder bags. And I, I mean, the ones that kind of go across your body, uh, not a knapsack hanging out behind you. Um, I have zippered pockets and I'll show you what I carry in them uh, that this, but this go inside pockets. So they're really tough to get at. Um, if you're staying somewhere and you have um, a safe lodging place where things can be kept safe, leave most of your valuables there, including your passport. Um, if it's not safe, bring your passport with you. Um, hostels, I've stayed in hostels and I stay in ones that have locked cupboards that you can put a knapsack and anything else in and you can take, you can lock it up and take the key and go out for the day. And often hotels have safes and many hotels now even have a safe inside the room, like a little safe box that you can lock things in and either take the key with you or a lot of the ones I've been lately have a code that you can enter. You can create a code and enter for that. So you can put your, your valuables in there if you feel you need to. So those are some of my suggestions about uh, safety. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, we could stop. A lot of the hotel here. desks, you know, they'll give you safety tips. If you're, you know, is it, you just ask, is it safe to walk out here? And they'll tell you not after six o'clock or, Yes, but stay on this side or whatever. That's right. That's right. The hotel desk will tell you. And that's what I often do. Um, you know, one of the things I'd say, if you're going to be uh, traveling internationally with someone or by yourself, you, it's don't be a wallflower. Ask questions uh, and keep yourself safe. I think everywhere I've gone, that's where it's totally new. And if I was by myself and I have traveled quite a bit solo, I always ask. Um, I was, I stayed in, uh, I went to um, Trier in Germany uh, several years back, I tacked it on at the end of a work trip and stayed in a town next to Trier and took the train over into the city. And it was a pretty quiet town, but I just asked, I said, is this town safe after, after dark? You know, I'm, I'm probably going to be coming back. What well, was October? So I mean, I'm probably going to be coming back seven o'clock in the evening. It'll be dark. Oh yeah. They said it's a totally safe place. Don't worry about that. So um it's always a wise thing to do. Um, I had a, a, a problem in Rome. Um, we went to the ATM and some people came in where we were and they're not supposed to. Um, and then we were having trouble with it anyway. And we didn't know what to do because we didn't want to be rude in their country. You know, in the, in the States, I would have said, just kind of, you know, back off. You're not supposed to be in here. But in the country, in a, in a country, I mean, you, you know, you're a guest there and you didn't, you know, so we didn't know what to do. And what happened was, you know, 
even though I try to block them, they saw what we were doing, got our credit card and had already, by the time we got back to the hotel, which was, you know, and, and we canceled the card within 10 minutes, they had already tried to uh, charge a bunch of stuff on our card. So that was one thing, you know, we knew that you know, we, we knew they shouldn't have been there and we didn't know how to tell them you know, without creating an international incident. That was one. And the other thing is my husband always, um, you know, those little cards that they send you from AARP or from, um, oh, um, you know, like the National Space Museum. They're like credit cards and things like that you, that you never use. He would put them in his pocket, his back pocket, so that they would reach and think that they got something. Oh. And it's just like a credit card, but it's not. Um, so a decoy. Yeah, the decoy. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I have. I carry this all the time. This is a little uh, money clip and that's, and it's, uh, it, it doesn't hold well. Yeah. It, it, it holds euros. They maybe stick out a little bit, but that's a good way to just to keep bills safe. And then this, I keep everything. I have a very slim little wallet. that's hardly bigger than a credit card. I actually got this in Europe and it has a little section in the middle for putting bills and then it just has several places for cards. And that's all I ever carry. And it's so thin and so small, it fits inside a zippered pocket, it's inside a pocket in my pants. So that that's I've just developed that as a safe way over the years not to carry a big fat wallet around with me anywhere, which, which is visible. The other thing what to do, do is if, you, if you're at an ATM and you've just gotten cash, you don't really want to flash the bills. I stop, put everything tucked neatly away back in my pocket before I exit the ATM. So where do you keep your passport? If um, my lodging is safe, I keep it in the lodging locked up oh. or uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think I, most of the lodging I've stayed in is safe. Mm. Uh, I can't think of any place I've been that hasn't been. When I was walking the community to Santiago, my uh, passport was on me all the time. <laughs> For one thing, you're required to show it every time you stay in an albergue or the hostels, they re register your, your passport. So um, I just kept it in my pocket and I might have a pair of travel. Well, I have a pair of hiking pants, um, which have that inside zippered pocket. And I, and uh, I've always had something like that. And it's usually inside that pocket. Um, I've always heard it's sort of like what the last lady just mentioned. And that is you carry expired cards or a bunch of, in other words, you have a fake wallet that's got cards that aren't any good. <laughs> you know, so like if somebody tries to stick you up, you give them the fake wallet where they walk away happy thinking they've gotten something. But I sounds like a good idea. It's just, I'm like you, I travel with so light, with so little on me that the idea of having a second wallet, but I just wondered if anyone else had heard that and anyone else had done that. I, I guess not. I have heard of that. I guess my thought is um, I'd rather sp uh, spend the time making sure you can be in safe places. It's interesting. Um, was it Jane or Nancy that mentioned Rome? I'm forgetting which of you was that brought up Rome. Um, <laughs> Rome always seems to come up when people talk about thievery or pickpocketing or something like that. And uh, my wife and I were in Rome. And that's the last place we flew home from in 2019, last time I was on an airplane. And uh, it was really crowded. I mean, there were people from all over the world there and there were just crowds everywhere. And we did think, well, you know, there could be pickpockets in these crowds. And we never got close enough to anybody, I think, but once we got close enough to some other people, but we again had a small cross the body bag and um, I, just, I just didn't worry about it. And we didn't go any neighborhoods or down any alleys or any place that didn't feel safe. So we we're pretty much in broad daylight with the, with, the, with the public everywhere. So we were just trying to be aware of where we were the whole time. A little cross bag that's no bigger almost than that little credit card thing that you had. And then I literally belt over it. So no one can even yank it. In other words, if someone tried to even yank it off of you, it's, it's belted to you as well. And Susan, who's not here tonight, but she was showing this little nifty wristband she has that she can put cards inside. <laughs> I, you know what? I'm trying not to be, um, what do you call it? Uh, but what, what, where, where am I going to put my, my uh, makeup and everything? Lipstick and 
all that. You, you leave it in the room when you're out walking around the city during the day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's a man saying that. So, I mean, I, honestly, I mean, that's, <laughs> I don't carry those things. So I'm not a very good authority, but I would say carry the minimum of what you, what you need to take with you. I would always, you know, have a little stub of a, a lip pencil that I would carry. There you go, Arnita. Thanks, Pat. So, really, so one of the other women here needs to give you better advice than me. I've carried a, a backpack around, a lightweight one, that's got my maps and extra stuff and maybe some crackers or something. So that's where, but if I'm ever someplace where it starts to get a little bit, I just turn it around and just wear it on the front. And, and you just kind of, um, but everyone, I, it, and for a long time, I was, oh, don't wear a backpack, don't wear a backpack. But when you're in Europe, every European's got a backpack on. I mean, it's just the way they, because they're out all day, they're walking and the lipstick and all that. And they don't really, it keeps both hands free. So you're not really dealing with a purse. But as far as anything important, money and credit cards, that's on my body. But usually I need an extra sweater or just the extra stuff because you're going to be out all day and a real lightweight backpack. And they also are making now the little the little ones that have a drawstring that are backpack, you know, that, so they're even harder to get into there, but well, that are just good for maps and stuff and nothing, nothing of value, but that lipstick or that if you're someone that really feels like they've got to have a comb and, you know, stuff with them you just throw that in there and if somebody grabs it it's like well they got the well, lipstick usually usually i i i i found that so many europeans wear them and only when you're in places that are known to have pickpockets and crowded situations you just turn it around and wear it on the front and kind of have your arms crossed over you and in and, and all that but you don't i think if you as long as you sort of dress in black and kind of blend in with Europeans and kind of wear the same thing they do. That's, that's kind of what I found. In my class tomorrow, I have a class tomorrow at 11 about how to pack for two weeks in a carry on bag. And one of the things I'll show you is my stuff sack. I have a little knapsack that folds up about the size of my fist. And it is one of the best things I've ever gotten. And I think it only cost about 30, $30 and I can stick it inside anything, anything I'm traveling with. And it, it becomes a nice size little knapsack. I can throw on my back. I can throw it around my front. Like when we were in the buses in Rome, we just, I put the knapsack on the front. My, my wife pulled her cross shoulder bag around the front. So we didn't have to worry about that. It's a great little thing. Weighs, not, weighs practically nothing. Rip, rip stock, rip stop nylon. So you could put your, your, um, so your wife things, in that. To put her things in there. She put, yeah, she put everything in there. That's where we stick our extra jacket and uh, I can even, you know, I actually keep my camera on my body across my, my, my bag too. And it isn't a huge camera. So, uh, and there's different ways you can, you can uh, have cameras. If you got one of those big cameras, you know, big d digital SLR across your shoulder, that screams tourist, but that's okay. If that's what you want to carry, you know, for, for doing photography. Elaine, did you have a comment or question? No. Okay. Wasn't sure if I'd seen a hand go up there. We have a couple more minutes. Um, Great, great experiences sharing tonight. I appreciate all your uh, insights. And obviously there is a difference to women, women and men, what they want to carry when they're out in the, in the day in the city. Uh, but I want to encourage you to come to that class tomorrow morning. I'll show you how I pack for two weeks in a carry-on. Also the types of carry-ons I have. I'll even share a little bit about different types of carry-ons. So it gives you, give you some thought, the difference between the two-wheel and four-wheel variety or Actually, now I'm traveling with just a backpack because after I walked for six weeks with everything in a 15 pound backpack, I've decided I really don't need much when I go anywhere. So uh, that's another way to do it. But I'm not, I won't recommend that necessarily to anyone else, but I can tell you it does work. Any more comments or questions? You've been a great group. Um, hey, Russ, I, I've had better luck with messenger bags. Sometimes, especially if you're going to museums, they get a bit nervous with backpacks. They're always afraid you're going to bump into it. Whereas the messenger, you're able to swivel it over in the front and they seem to be more accepting of it. That's a good point, Dania. A, a messenger bag. Um, a, a lot of what I'm, I'm referring to is cross the body bags are very similar to that. And you're right that um, 
it, it is a bit awkward if you're in a crowded place like a museum or even the museum store. That's where I've been. And that backpack is on your back and you turn around, you hit it. You're right. Um, a lot they, of places won't make, they just make you check it. Yeah. Well, then you could be Rick Steves. He always seems to have a knapsack over one shoulder wherever he's going. These, we all, a lot of us saw the Rick Steves videos. Well, well, that's a trick I found one time is I did have my little backpack, but it, the, I just reconfigured the, the straps so that I used it like a shoulder bag and I had it under my arm and then there they didn't go. say anything to me. There you go. Any more comments or questions about safety, any of these topics that we've discussed tonight, physical safety, keeping valuable safe, COVID-19 restrictions? Some of these tips are not only good when you travel, but just in the grocery store or around, I used to always you know, have an older shoulder bag and I would put it up under my armpit, you know, higher up. So you're kind of protecting it and holding it. I was looking for a picture of my wife with her cross the body bag. And I didn't find one. I bet I've got one somewhere. I might just have her oh, put it on and take the, and take, take a picture of her for the next time we do this, because it was a really great buy. We actually got it probably on Amazon. I don't like to always admit that because I do like buying shopping in other places, but this was on Amazon. It was a good deal. And uh, by the way, it also wrapped up, folded up, not quite as small as my fist, a little bit bigger than that, but very lightweight so that she could, you know, if she didn't want to use it for a part of the trip. I, actually, we got it when we went to Italy to walk. And so we were hiking every day and it was just in, in that it was folded up tightly into her backpack. And then she could get it out in the evening when we wanted to go somewhere. And I've, I've wondered why she doesn't just use that as her purse, but um, that's her choice. And, and I noticed one of the guests had a lot of chains on. Um, you know, I would recommend leaving those at home. There, there might be times when you have a meeting or something to go to, um, but for most travel, you don't need jewelry like that. And it, so it you know, really- What's the point? <laughs> I want to go and have a good time. <laughs> it's just for two weeks, Arnita. <laughs> Then they buy some local food. And maybe meet a uh, um, romantic guy or something. <laughs> well, you can buy something then. You can buy something. Okay. <laughs> you know, I always tell people when you travel, and this is part of my class tomorrow on packing, you can always get what you need where you go. Usually. Not everywhere. If you're going on African safari, you may not be able to get what you need. But if you're going to Europe, South America, everywhere I've been, I can pretty much get what I needed when I went there. So if you're worried, like, do I really need this? I'm not sure. Don't bring it. And then if you need it when you get there, okay, you go get one. You can bring it home as a souvenir. Um, one other area I was just going to mention in safety, physical safety is a story I remember. I'll close with this one. In 2014, my wife and I went to Columbia to visit with our son and his wife who were there for five years. And uh, they work in a church relief organization. And we were in... Um, Bogota, which is a uh, city that is uh, huge. And the first time I saw militarized police was in Bogota, but you get used to that. The other thing I saw though, we went into a, a region called the Choco, which is one of the poorest uh, regions of Colombia. It's Afro-Colombia. All the people there are descendants of slaves brought from Africa. Uh, they speak, they have a, a culture that is blended between African and Spanish. It's a fascinating place and we loved it. However, it's also one of those areas of Colombia that still has armed groups in it. And my son and his wife were perfectly safe there. They said, don't worry about it, but let me give you one piece of advice, dad, or two, sorry, two pieces of advice, dad. First one is put away your camera. You don't wanna take pictures because you don't know, um, well, first of all, I always tell people don't take pictures of policemen anywhere in the world. But he said, you especially don't wanna accidentally get a picture of a policeman in a, in a photo. And also if you're just taking a picture in this in the street corners, you don't know if one of the members of those armed groups is just walking around the street and doesn't want their picture taken, even though you have no idea who he is. So he said, put away your camera. Nobody will mess with you. He was right. The other bit of advice was he, he said, don't ask uncomfortable questions of people like, uh, do you pay uh, for safety here, you know, to keep uh, armed groups away from me? Don't ask people that. We were as safe as could be in that city for five days. I loved it. I would go back there tomorrow, but my son had become a local and he had the bit of advice. 
to tell me how to stay safe while I was there. The best one, of course, was keep my camera put away. So, well, thanks everybody. Uh, we'll send notes out after the class. The links that I showed you will be in the class notes and also some more upcoming classes. I'll mention some of those. Tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time, I am doing the class on uh, how to pack for two weeks in a carry-on. That should be a fun one. Uh, and then um, I'll be just also sharing tomorrow at four o'clock about that pilgrimage I took to Italy. If you want to join us, walking the Via di Francesco from uh, Rome to Assisi. It runs between um, Florence and Rome. And my wife and I walked it the opposite direction. Friday, I'll be giving 11 o'clock. I'll also be giving my top 10 travel tips. So four T's, top 10 travel tips. And you can come and share with me any of your top travel tips. And if they're better than the ones I have, I'll put them in my list uh, because I'm always looking for good tips. And uh, I'm not afraid to say someone's got some better ideas than I have. Thanks again for being in the class tonight. Look for your notes. I love feedback. Any ways I can make the class well, better, please let me know. I'm curious. You've always talked about this walk on the El Camino. Um, did you walk it alone or is, did you start alone and then just kind of walk with people or do you literally walk by yourself? I went, I say I went solo. Uh, my wife joined me after four weeks and I met people hundreds of other pilgrims along the way that became friends. So uh, it was, I was called a solo walker and there were a lot of other people there walking solo. That means they went by themselves. But of course I enjoyed every evening uh, in an albergue, getting to know people, having meals with them from all across the world. It was a great experience. So I'll well, share we, about that. I've done yeah. that class and I'll do it again. But like the actual walking, would you end up walking with somebody? I was usually during the day walking by myself and that was nice. I also went for solitude. Okay. And, uh, and so if I wanted to walk with somebody, I would, and would, and if I didn't want to, I didn't. So. The El Camino was, a, I think, originally a Christian pilgrimage. And, you know, there's a legend to put a, a pebble in your, pebbles for all your problems and things you wanted to release and let go up, put it and in I, your backpack. And then when you got to Santiago, you dump them all. I did. I, I brought something along with me. He actually put it in a place called Cruz de Ferro, which is a large stone pile or cairn on, at, the, at the highest point in the Camino. And it's a modern tradition for people to bring that. You're right. It's all, Come to that class. I show, I'll be doing it in June or July again. I did it a lot in January and February and into March. I'll, I'll repeat it. And you all should make sure you come to it where I talk about walking 500 miles over five weeks. And, and my I wife joined me at the end. And I think that, you know, Spain is really um, tough. Their laws are really tough for thieves and pickpockets and things like that. So you have very little crime along that Camino. The Camino is very safe. And I met lots of women walking either with one companion or solo who were over 60 and felt just fine. Um, and all the ones I know, I asked them to share with about it. They said they felt very safe the whole time. So that's, a, that's, that's good. Well, thanks again, everyone. I uh, hope to see some of you all in some other classes. Again, give me the feedback and look out for that email and have a great evening. You too. Bye.